Hello and welcome to Ditching Hourly. I'm Jonathan Stark. Today I'm joined by guest Michael Zaparski. Michael, welcome to the show. Hey Jonathan, great to be with you and thanks for having me. Hey, my pleasure. So for folks who haven't come across you before, could you give us a quick sort of name, rank, and serial number? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I never actually heard that or thought about it that way, but uh, <laughs> uh, my background is uh, building consulting businesses. It's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Um, and for 11 of that, I've been running consulting success uh, with my cousin and business partner, Sam, as well as uh, a great team that we have here, uh, helping consultants all around the world in different industries to really optimize their consulting business models, uh, to get clear around who their ideal clients are, uh, develop stronger, more effective messaging, uh, really look at how they can package and position and place value on and price their services, and then develop a, a marketing engine and system that will allow them to to build a pipeline um, of qualified leads that they can really add value for and uh, and establish relationships with. Hmm, great. So all of that all of that fits squarely into what the audience is looking for when they come to Ditching Hourly. So um, let's start off with positioning. So in kind of two potentially two different angles on this. So uh, maybe the first place to start would be, uh, let's say you're working with someone in say a coaching capacity or something like that. And they're a soloist or a really small firm, say maybe two, you know, a couple partners, maybe three people, but you know, low head count and they are struggling. They're concerned that, you know, how are we going to, what do we say when someone says, why should we hire you instead of McKinsey or Deloitte or computer associates or Accenture? You know, how do you compete against those sort of behemoth brands if you're a soloist or a small firm? It's important to focus on your strengths, not to try and compensate for your weaknesses. Uh, the first thing that I would uh, look at here and, you know, in conversation with the person that you're speaking with uh, is really that when you hire a larger firm, really what you're hiring is, um, you know, a bunch of junior people that are going to spend a lot of time uh, learning about your business. And when you are engaging with a boutique consultancy or an advisor, uh, you know, coach, so forth, um, you're typically getting a senior person in many cases that has even maybe worked at one of those um, large consultancies beforehand or br brings senior level expertise. And so they're working directly on your project. So whereas uh, with a larger firm, um, you know, you're having a senior person go out and win the business and kind of manage the relationship, but the actual work is typically done by more junior people. Uh, and I think what you also want to look at is what typically happens in, um, in many situations. And what I hear from many of our clients is that, you know, they'll actually get brought in after, uh, they've worked with when, you know, one of their clients has worked with a large firm and they've come in, they've delivered this big document full of recommendations and then they leave. <laughs> uh, and then that organization needs to figure out what to actually do with that stuff and they don't know what to do with it. And so that's now where they're looking for help. And so the, the boutique consultant or the smaller consulting firm will often get brought in because they're prepared to really roll up their, their sleeves uh, and support and work very closely and serve uh, at a high level of, of engagement and kind of intimacy with the client. So those would be some of the things, right? Um, the other is that I don't have the overhead that a large firm does. And so I'm, uh, you know, I'm not going to be charging you for, uh, you know, for keeping the lights on and for having thousands of people at the office and, uh, and everyone's compensation packages, right? You know, we're priced on what we're doing and the value that we're, we're creating here for you, but we're, we're able to deliver that in a much more efficient and, and effective way for you. So again, it's, it's really about not trying to compare yourself in, in terms of what you don't have compared to those people. You don't have the brand name, you don't have the recognition, but what do you have that is actually an advantage to your end client uh, that those firms don't have? Right, exactly. So what kind of clients, so this is going to get hard to talk about because it's like clients, clients, clients all the way down. Mm -hmm. But so let's say you're coaching Alice. Alice is a solo consultant and she is working with you to uh, you know, improve her business, all the things you said at the beginning, get more leads, increase her fees, uh, everything. Uh, would you ever recommend to her that she pick a particular type of client to go after? And I ask that because I, I know anecdotally uh, that larger companies, people, you know, big, like fortune 50 companies mm -hmm. will sometimes never consider a non-brand name consultant just because of the risk factor or because they literally just want to walk to the board and say, oh, we hired McKinsey or we hired the best. We spared no expense. And they don't really care about the budget. It's so, a safe bet. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So we, agree. so we have the same experience there. So so I imagine, certainly I would do this with Alice. I would say, well, you know, if you got really specific about the kind of clients who 
who would value the list of things that you just rattled off, you know, like not as much overhead, more nimble, working with the seniors instead of juniors. Uh, what kind of, what kind of advice do you usually give in that case? Yeah. I mean, the really specializing and having a clear focus on who your ideal client is, is critical for, for any, uh, small firm, um, you know, or, or even independent consultant, uh, I don't think it's ever a wise thing to compare and, and to look at, call it the McKinsey or the Baines or the BCGs or Accenture's or you know Deloitte or so forth. Um, those organizations will will work with many different industries, um, but they're also recognized. They have a lot more resources and, and infrastructure and and kind of you know ability to to do that. Uh, if you're a small firm or an independent consultant, um, if you want to be known for something, you, you really do need to focus in, especially at the early stages, so that you can be known for something, you, you know, kind of plant your stake in the ground. But the other reason for that as well is that if you're very clear on who your ideal client is, then you can develop a message that will resonate with them. Uh, if you're saying that you work with all kinds of different businesses or all kinds of different people, uh, then your message will therefore be quite wide and vague and, and general, mm -hmm. uh, which means that you're not going to stand out as much as someone who really is targeting and speaking to the specific problems or desires or or goals, um, you know that that someone else would. So again, coming back to really what I'm trying to say here is, I think it's important that that people do specialize, um, and that you're once you have that, you're then able to develop a message that will really resonate with your ideal client. And that's another advantage compared to, for example, a larger organization that casts a bit of a wider net but doesn't come across as a, at the same level of specialization and expertise that you can. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. The example I give, you know, to keep using Alice as the example, is if she, you know, focused on helping doctors, then she can talk about on her in her marketing materials, she can talk about how I'll help you get more patients or have a better impact on your patients. But if she was going to focus in hospitality or, or restaurants, she'd say guests. And using the more specific language instead of the broader brush approach where you would just say, you know, we help you get more customers. It's just this generic higher level thing. It doesn't connect as much with the people who uh, you're going to want to attract. Yeah. So, and I think now, yeah, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I was going to say now more than ever, Jonathan, like I think this is especially important because people are being inundated with marketing messages and hype and just all kinds of stuff through, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever, you know, email. Mm -hmm. um, and that general approach, like you, you need to, to hit on what the conversation that is going on in the mind of, of, of the buyer, of the ideal client. Otherwise, they just discard you as, as kind of, you know, marketing fluff and spam uh, and you won't cut through. But if you have a message that when they see it or hear it, it instantly speaks to the conversation that is going on in their mind already, now you got their attention, right? And, and if you don't do that, then you don't get their attention and, and you lose. Yeah, it's arresting when they hit language that's very specifically geared toward them. Correct. It's, it's a complete game changer. So, but have you, I, I'm going to assume, it sounds like we've had a very similar experience. Um, I'm going to assume that when you work with people, you will find resistance from them in, in niching down on a particular target market. And they'll say things like, oh, but you know, I'm, I'm only getting a lead a month now. If I, you know, and I'm casting this big net, if I, if I just use a little net, I'm going to have no clients. I'm going to have no leads. First of all, what's your feeling on that argument? And what do you do to work, help people work through that fear to get down to some kind of a specialty or a niche. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably one of the, the biggest challenges and concerns that people come up against uh, because the reality is they likely can help a lot of different people. Uh, but just because you can doesn't mean that that's going to be the most effective path. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question really becomes, you know, do you want to be, um, you know, a, a little minnow in a vast ocean uh, or do you want to be a big fish in a small pond, right? Which is going to stand out more. And if you just kind of visualize that for a moment, it becomes very clear that a, a big fish in a small pond stands out a lot more. It's it's easier to see. Um, and there's a lot more visibility and awareness. Uh, that's what people need to do. And so, yes, it can be a bit counterintuitive. It can certainly be scary because you feel like you're removing uh, opportunity. But in fact, by becoming more focused, you're going to create a lot more opportunity because you, number one, are able to identify who your true ideal client is. And now when you know who they are and you have the right criteria that is specific, you can actually go out and find them. But the other part is, again, you can develop that message that will really speak to what's going on. If you if you don't know who they are or if it's too uh, wide of a net, right? if that ocean is too big, then it, you can't cut through the clutter. You can't stand out, right? The noise is, is going to be too strong for you to really uh, be, be visible to people. 
And so, um, yes, it's a challenging thing to do, but what we've seen consistently with clients over the years is the more that they focus in and kind of get narrow and, and specialize, even though that might be hard for them to do, that's when they actually start seeing and feeling more traction. Um, so if you're going from you know one lead right now per month, uh, you might feel well by removing all these different industries that I'm going after, um, you know, I'm, maybe I'm going to go to zero. Well, in fact, no. If you get very focused, and let's say you're just targeting manufacturing organizations, well, now your message is going to be targeted to manufacturing organizations. So you're going to actually start seeing more people respond to it typically because the message is really tailored specifically to them. It will, it will really resonate with them. But the other thing too is it'll save you a lot more time. Uh, it'll help you from you know becoming a crazy person because you don't have to manage all these different buckets in your mind anymore. You can be very clear about who you're targeting, what you're offering them, what you're saying. When someone says, what do you do? And, and you're working with five different industries, like how do you cover all that? What do you say to all five industries? That means you have to have what different landing pages yeah. or you know different messaging or different offers for all five people. That's, that's complexity. And if you want to grow a business that has scale to it, complexity doesn't scale. I could not agree more. I've seen this over and over and over again. And I'll just tell a quick story because it doesn't, it doesn't need to take a long time. So I, I just had the way that I usually do it with people, they're almost always resist. I say, well, let's just update your LinkedIn. It'll leave your website the way it is. It's sort of general. It's like, you know, uh, we help smart people solve big problems. You know, there's like generic word salad, <laughs> meaningless. Hey, I, I've probably seen that 20 times. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, so uh, I had uh, one student, I'm, I'm sort of deciding right now if I should say it, because I, I actually don't want to say it, what we picked for his positioning statement, because it's so specific, you could find it easily if I said it, and mm. I didn't, I don't have his permission to do that. So uh, anyway, if we said, you know, it was like this generic sort of like, I'm a smart guy, I'm a smart software developer guy, and I help, you know, he didn't even say I help people do a particular thing. It's like, here's a list of my skills, like a resume. And we said, well, you know, we talked about his best client that he currently had, his favorite one. I was like, wow, would you like to work with more guys like that? And he said, yeah, that would be great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do the same kind of thing with people like that. I said, okay, well, what's he like? You know, what's his job title? What's his deal? So we switched his headline. You know, on LinkedIn, your headline is that sort of tagline that goes underneath your name and your picture pretty much everywhere in the interface. So yep. when you connect with someone, they see your face, your name, and this tagline. And we switched it to something that was what I call a heck yeah headline where, you know, it was just where the, if the right person reads it, they're going to go, heck yeah. And he, he changed it. And that night he started getting messages from people who were like, we need to talk right now. Here's my phone number. Mm -hmm. It's dramatically, it does. It's not always that dramatic. It's usually not that dramatic, but it is like magic. When you do it, you know, you could pick a, you could pick a dud, you could pick some, you know, I've had people pick a dud target market it just was not a, there was no overlap in the Venn diagram between their skills and the target market they wanted to serve. But it usually there is an overlap. And in this particular case, there was a big overlap and it immediately turned into a, you know, like a half a dozen phone calls in a week, which is, yeah, I, it, it resonated, right? That's, that's really what, what you're saying is it it developed messaging that, yeah. Exactly. Right. So anyway, I, I couldn't be a bigger advocate for this. I think especially the, the other thing to, to bring up about this, because I know people are like, I don't know. It seems like what they're saying makes sense, but I don't know if I could do it. The other thing to consider is that the world is gigantic. It's so much bigger than you can imagine. Uh, it just doesn't fit in your head. And if you, if you, I just did an exercise recently where I did a kind of a rebrand for a hair salon just as an exercise, they weren't a client or anything. And, you know, I said, well, if, you know, if you cut hair, what are some different things you could niche down on? And one, one of the things was male film actors who need like a retro, you know, like a retro uh, grooming look. And so I came up with this little, you know, idea for whatever, it doesn't matter what the idea was, but you know, you would maybe think, oh, if I ran a hair salon that only served male film actors, I'd go to business. There's just not enough of them. I can barely keep in business, you know, with the foot traffic that comes by my salon now. But a quick Google search will tell you that there's, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's in the hundreds of thousands of people who are currently acting. So let's say half of them are male and some, you know, in some portion of that are film people who work in film. They're not all celebrities or famous, maybe. Well, definitely. But there's loads of them, way more than you could ever serve. And if you do the math really quick, I just, and I, in the thing I did the math and I'm like, you would have so many customers. If you owned this space, if you were the big fish in this small pond, 
you'd be turning people away. You'd have to hire people if you wanted to serve everybody who came to you. Yeah. The markets are Jonathan, way bigger than you think. I was going to add just one, one more point there. You know, as you were um, speaking before, uh, both the hesitation that people have, mm -hmm. uh, and I think a question that might be helpful for some is, you know, what's the alternative? Like, if you <laughs> stay where you are right now, uh, and you want to protect and you want to just keep doing what you're doing, like if it's working for you, great, right? Keep doing it. But if it's not working for you, then then what's the alternative? Like you can't just keep doing the same thing, right? It's that, that tip, what's that definition of insanity is continue the same thing, right? It's not working for you or, or whatever, like over and over again. And so you, if it's not working for you, try something different. And uh, what Jonathan and I are sharing here today is really, you know, a proven way for you to get your message um, and to get much greater clarity around who your ideal client is and develop a message that will really resonate with them so that you can start having more response, more response that will lead to more conversations. Yeah. I mean, I think it does, it resonates with people when, when I put it like this, it seems to click with people where I say, would you rather be just one of many of whatever you do, or would you want to be the one and only? And they all say, well, I want to be the one and only. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you want to be the only, like one and only at or of, or for who, for whom? Mm -hmm. And and then that's when the panic sets in, but they know it's right. It's just this kind of lizard brain, uh, sort of pushback. But anyway, do you have any, do you have any, um, other than sort of appealing to the rational mind, is there some way that you've found to kind of coax people to, you know, coax the horse to the water? Uh, well, I mean, breaking it down, uh, as part of an exercise where you might start off and just get them to kind of explore and, and to feel more comfortable with it. You know, if you start off uh, as an example, just writing out like, you know, I'm a, you know, a business consultant and then go to small business consultant and then, okay, what's like a level deeper than that. And, oh, it's a small business, you know, lead generation consultant. Okay. Well, what's even more specialized than that. It's a small business lead generation consultant for, you know, accounting firms or something, right? Mm -hmm. And and you get them to kind of just look at those differences and to see, well, which one do you think here would, if your ideal client, if you said, was really accounting firms, you really want to work with them, you, they're the most profitable for you, the most enjoyable. Yes, you can help others, but let's just, if you were just to start with that as part of your marketing, because the reality is you can't target everyone all at once anyways, mm -hmm. right? You know, which of these messages would resonate more with them? Uh, and that typically helps people to see. And I think the other thing that I've shared a lot with clients, Jonathan, is um, that to look at, their ideal client, their specialization, their messaging, you're not setting anything in stone forever. Like nothing is forever, right? You're, that's the beautiful thing about business is that you're able to make adjustments uh, as you, you learn, you get more feedback from the marketplace. Uh, but at the same time, no, none of us can physically, unless we, you know, we have billions of dollars and, you know, or one of these organizations that can just throw money in and hope that something works. Uh, we need to be very careful and to look at, you know, where do we actually want to spend our time and our energy and our money and our resources because they're not unlimited. Uh, and you can, there's no one out there that can effectively get in front of, you know, five different industries or develop messages and do all that. Like, it's just, it's not possible. Yeah. So yeah. just where do you want to start? Let's just look at it as a starting point and let's just focus for the first, you know, X number of weeks or months or whatever it might be on going down this path. And then let's see how it works right. and let's see the feedback that you get. And then based on that feedback, if it really seems that there, you know, there's not much potential or there's too much pushback or there's some challenges, we can always course correct. You can always make adjustments, but you don't want to be down the road looking back thinking, oh, like I really regret that I didn't do this because of X reason, right? So just by getting them a little bit more comfortable and feeling that, yeah, okay, that's good to know that I'm not stuck in stone, that I can still make adjustments. This is part of a natural evolution. Uh, helps, I've found people to get much more comfortable in at least making that initial decision to go down that path. Right. Yeah. I, I do the exact same thing. I'll say like, let's think of it as a, as like a marketing campaign, like a three to six month marketing campaign and not like, uh, you know, an identity change, which is how they feel. They feel like they're changing right. their identity. I want to loop back to when you did that exercise where you zoomed, zoomed in, zoomed in, zoomed in, you said business consultant, small business consultant, small business, uh, lead generation consultant, I think. And then yep. when you said small business lead generation consultant for accountants, boom, I had a Rolodex moment. Until that moment, I was just like, okay, okay, okay. But when you got down that far, I was like, oh, that would be good for Pat. There you, you go. You know, and it's yeah. like this moment, it sounds crazy. But when you say, you know, if, if you say, oh, I help small businesses make more money or you, if I help, I mean, I see ones all the time that are like, uh, we help, we help companies save money. Come on. <laughs> like, that's not credible. Like it's uh, not, it's just like soggy. 
Well, it's nothing. It, it, it just, it goes in one out, you know, in one year out the other, you're not going to remember that, um, you know, an hour from now, never mind weeks from now, there's, right. there's nothing there to hook, hook you in uh, a quick story. So many years ago, uh, I was introduced to, um, a very successful investor, um, uh, and his office was down by the Pan Pacific. So this is in Vancouver, uh, overlooking the, the Harbor and the ocean and so forth, really beautiful place. Uh, and I got the meeting cause I had asked someone, I actually recently come back from Japan building a business there. And I was looking to connect with more people in Vancouver and I was trying to find out like who he, he might know that I could, you know, meet with and talk with to see if I could help them. And I was really focusing around lead generation and, and marketing. And I remember I sat down in his office and he said, okay, so Michael, you know, what can I do to help you? Uh, and I, I first just kind of like rambled off saying, well, I'm, you know, I, I help people with their marketing and I was so general. And his response was, uh, okay, um, yeah, let me think about that. And I remember walking out, the sun was shining. I walked out of his office and I was like, oh, I just messed up. Like, I blew what, that, what yeah. That yeah. And it, it really read, so I emailed him later on. Um, but what happened very, like just to this exact point is I was making him do all the work. And so the way I actually illustrate this with, uh, with clients and I've come maybe in some of the books I've talked about this, but it's like, imagine that you, you're in your computer and you, you're searching for something on your computer but you're asking the search you're doing has to go through every single file, every folder, you know, every inch of, of your hard drive to try and locate that. Hmm. Now, if you have a lot of files and you've been using your computer for a long time, right, it might take some time to, to locate it. But imagine now that you zoomed in and you did a search just in one specific folder to find one specific file. It'd be a lot easier. It'd be a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And so when, when we're general, when people are general in, in describing what it is that they do or who their ideal client is, and especially like when you're asking for referrals, um, it's very hard for people to, to give you referrals or to give you anything valuable because you're making them do all the work. You're asking them to kind of like go through their mental Rolodex and to search every single folder and every file to try and find something that connects to what you're offering, which typically for most people is too much work. And so they just give up, they just stop. But if you can narrow in and say, yeah, I'm looking for this specific type of person that, you know, they're part of a country club or they're a financial advisor and they have this number of employees typically and they're often looking to, you know, to generate more leads or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Now it's very easy for somebody to, to locate and to get very clear. And so when I went back and I specified more of the type of company that I was working with and where I had the most success, it was very easy for him to come back and say, well, okay, here's three people you should talk to. Yeah, exactly. And, and to, to extend the software metaphor, the general request on the computer, the process times out. The person is just like, they give up, you know? Right. And the, the flip side of this is, and check this, you know, anyone listening to this, check the show notes because I'll link to a PDF I have called The Introduction Game. And it, it's exactly the, what, the way I phrase it is uh, that you need to give your circle of friends and family and colleagues the tools they need to help you. They all want to help you. They would all love to introduce you to people and matchmaking. People love being a matchmaker, you know, when it goes successfully and they already trust you and you're probably only one connection away from your dream clients, but your friends and all these people who know you and trust you have no idea who you can help or who they should introduce you to unless you tell them. So I had this exercise you can go through with colleagues where you take turns playing the introduction game. And it's not that you're going to, it's not one of these networking things where tit for tat reciprocity, like, you know, give me your contact list and I'll, I'll, you know, whatever. It's not like that. It's like you go back and forth with, with each other doing, basically playing out the scenario that you just described where, you know, you're both like, you, you're helping each other pick the right level of focus. So you kind of go back and forth as you go more and more specific until the other one has an aha moment. The Rolodex moment happens and they're like, Oh yeah, I do know somebody who trains thoroughbred horses, something really specific. And, yeah. and then you're like, you're like, okay, now what should I tell them? That's the second half of the game is like, okay, I'd be happy to introduce you, but what should I say? Like, what do you want to do? Jump on a phone call probably. And what's in it for them? Like, what can I tell my friend who, uh, raises thoroughbred horses or whatever I said, trains thoroughbred horses. What can I tell them? Why should they talk to you? Because now the person in the middle, the introducer has, you know, wants, doesn't want to, uh, so I don't want to say it in a negative way, but they don't want to lose the social capital of introducing, uh, making a meaningless introduction and wasting the horse person's time. So they right. want, they want to defend the horse person so that their time's not wasted and they get something out of the meeting. 
but you've got everything going for you. But without getting specific like that, all of your friends and family and colleagues are powerless to help you. It's, it's mm -hmm. you giving them the tools to make introductions for you. And I think everybody knows referrals are solid gold. It's probably the best way to get leads because they already trust you. Fair. Yeah. You want to make it easy for people to, to do that. Exactly. All right, cool. So let's say we have gotten focused on our positioning, focused on our marketing, and we're getting tons of leads. How, you know, if we're, and we're talking about a solo or very small boutique firm. How do you scale that up? What are the, what are the tactics or strategies that you would use in general? I know it's different for everyone, but I'm sure it's different for everyone, but how would you scale that up so that they could continue to kind of increase their impact, work with more people or, or, um, I don't want to say better, but you know, clients that are a better fit, mm -hmm. like, how would you, what are the different, uh, ways that you find people, the common ways that you find people scaling up their business without hiring a whole bunch of junior developers? So are you, uh, just to be very clear, are you th thinking more in terms of taking someone from a lead to, you know, engaging and kind of winning the business or more in terms of the service product offering and, and scaling the business model, uh, or, or playing with the business model so that you're able to, to scale what you're actually offering. The latter. The latter. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, so we we're kind of talking a little bit before we hit record, right, about this and, and what allows companies to, in this kind of industry, to, to really scale. The way I always break this down is that there's there's really three different business models that people can, can use to grow their business. Uh, the first is, right, independent solo, where you're a single person, maybe you have an assistant or, or something like that. Um, and you can reach, you know, a seven figure business doing that. There aren't that many people that have done that successfully. It is certainly possible, uh, but it really requires focusing on identifying and engaging and adding a lot of value and building relationships with, with very, um, you know, solid and high level people, uh, and, and ensuring that your price point and what you're offering is, is at a significant premium. And so, you know, typically you're working fewer projects, but each of those projects needs to be at a very high level of compensation. Another twist on that is, and this actually works quite well for a solo independent, uh, you know, consultant or, or person in that space is to bring in, uh, and, and adjust the way that you are setting your fees to be more strategic with performance components. Um, so that if you're really working with an organization where you see that there's significant upside potential and you tie uh, what you're doing to that upside, uh, then that's a great way to be able to scale what your fees are. And I'll give you one quick example. Spina, one of our clients just yesterday about this, he works with some very large organizations um, in the resource space. Uh, and essentially what he's helping them to do can, can create an additional hundred million, in some cases, even $300 million or more for those organizations. Well, there's a lot of value being created by what he's doing and he can capture that value. And so even as a solo independent consultant, uh, for, for him, you know, one project could potentially be $300,000 for even just a few months of work. Mm -hmm. Um, so that would be one way to, to really scale. The second way, uh, would be to go down the, the firm model. And so this would be the kind of the, the classic consulting approach where uh, you're you're scaling or you're you're growing by essentially adding more associates or more people that are you know billing hours. Uh, it might be a project based, but often can be billable hours. Uh, and the way to really scale that is right more people, and you're collecting a margin between what the client is paying you and what you're paying out to the people that are that are doing the work. Uh, and that's you know going to be great for some people if you like the idea of managing. Uh, and building, you know, more of a business that could potentially run without you. But I know that for many people, they leave the corporate world or they leave, you know, their job because they're tired of managing people and they don't want that. They want to just essentially be in full control of themselves and not have to worry about other people. Uh, so that's the second model. And then the third uh, is productization, right? It's really looking at how do you take your, your skills, your expertise, your knowledge, and then start to build systems and processes around it so that you're, you're really developing mastery. And so you're not going in and, and providing five or 10 different things. Uh, more often you're getting good at, at one, maybe two, but let's just say one very specific thing. You're solving one very specific problem for a client and then you're just getting better and better and better at that because you're doing it over and over and over again, which leads to essentially you know developing mastery in that, in that area. And because you're developing more systems and more processes uh, around that, uh, you're able to, if you need to plug in other people to help you with very specific aspects of the delivery uh, of that that offering. Uh, but because again, it's productized, um, you're able to benefit from, you know, you build it once, you're able to you know, essentially you then have 
the same model or the same kind of you know delivery uh, component and mechanism that you can apply to to more clients. So there's a lot of leverage in doing that, and that allows your profit margin to be significantly greater. Also increases the asset value of the business. So if you ever want to sell it, um, the business and the value is not tied to you. It's tied to the system and to the process that you're putting in in place. So those are kind of the the three typical models. There's no right or or wrong. It's really about finding what is the right model for you uh, that fits with your lifestyle, with your goals, you know, your financial, the impact that you want to have, um, your plans for the future. Uh, but then there's a, there's a fourth, and the fourth is really a hybrid approach. It's looking at what are the the right elements from those three that you want to bring into what you are doing. And we've you know we work with some that are pure play solo independent consultants, others that are building a firm, others that have productization, uh, and then many who are adding elements of productization to, for example, a solo independent firm or to a small firm. So does that does that kind of help in the direction of what you're thinking there, Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be news to anybody who's listening because it's all the, I mean, the, the firm model is, I'm, I'm, um, I'm against that for most people. Not, I shouldn't say that. It's not something that I support. So I'm just like you said, if you want to be a manager and that's what you want to do and build that kind of a firm, I am all for that. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever, but it's not what I teach here. What I teach here is it's for people who want to scale up without becoming a manager, without hiring a bunch of people, without worrying about, you know, 10 mortgages instead of one, yeah. uh, all of those things. So, so again, totally fine. If that's what you want to be, the thing that scares me about people going after that model is that is when they're billing by the hour and they think it's the only way to scale up. They're like, geez, I've been doing this for 10 years and I'm basically making the exact same money I made 10 years ago. You know, I've yeah. raised my hourly rate a couple of times, but I'm working like a dog and I can't even take a vacation because every time I, you know, every hour I spend in line at Disney world, I feel like I just lost 200 bucks. So it becomes a problem and they think, Oh, the only thing I can do is hire juniors and mark up their time. And, and so I'm, so that's, that's, Fine. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's a very. It's, what's interesting is, you know, it's. I think it's a bit of a bit, um, a little bit of a tangent, but maybe important for for everyone listening. Uh, is you know, oftentimes you know these days you see people talking about how much revenue they're making, or they're just talking about like how much money they're making, right, mm-hmm. and how much their their firm is generating. Um, but they're not telling you the whole story because oftentimes that's just the revenue side. Um, you know, they're not talking about their actual profit. Yeah, they be losing money. Sometimes, yeah, and, and I'm I'm you know not surprised anymore, but, but certainly, you know, talking to people who are running businesses that are doing whatever, you know, 1.5 million, 2.5 million, whatever it might be. And you find out that like, there's no money in the business They're you know, they're eking out 80,000 or a hundred thousand dollars a year maximum that they're taking home. And it's like, wow. So, you know, you, you have four or five people, you're running at that level, you have all these resources, you're, you're clearly like very busy because you, you're telling me you feel overwhelmed, mm-hmm. but you're hardly making any money from your actual business. To me, that's, that's uh, you know, a really big opportunity. It's, it's sad to see that because there's such a better path for people to really create a lot more impact and more freedom and, and work at significantly higher levels of profit. Yeah, I've seen it plenty of times where the, I'll talk to the principal and they say, I haven't taken a salary in six months. Because they're barely getting by, they're barely making payroll, and but yeah, yeah. oh, but yeah, we're doing ten million. No, okay. <laughs> so that that's I talk about I talk about revenue being a vanity metric and that profit's really what matters. And is you, if you can scale your profit without adding headcount, well, I mean, you can whatever. If you can increase your revenue without increasing your costs, okay, great. But <laughs> but generally, people will throw bodies at it when they get busy, and then things aren't busy, and now they've got all these bodies, and it's like, oh, this, here comes the stress. So mm-hmm. that so that option two really really scares me. That's my personal bias, though. It's fine for people who it's fine for. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I agree. I'm not. I'm not. Um, I, I never. When someone says like, "What's the best business model, Michael?" I always say, "Well, there isn't the best business model, right? right? Here's here's what they are. That you, like these are three proven models plus the fourth being the hybrid that they work. Now, what's more important is to figure out what's what, what's going to work for you. What what do you want? Right. For some people, they love the idea of working with a team and they get bored and you know, they, they can't work very well by themselves. Like they need that, that interaction. And so that model might be the right one because mm-hmm. even in, uh, in a firm model, we, we have one client that went from about 400,000 a year to 2 million a year, um, in less than 12 months. And, uh, they did that. So they're, they are a firm model. They have about six, seven people. Uh, but they did that really by productizing their offerings and mm-hmm. by looking at how to make, uh, every project that they engage in significantly more profitable and create also a lot more leverage in what they're doing so that 
you know, they're they're essentially re- be able to re- repeat or to get the benefits of what they've built before uh, for new clients. And so there are ways to take that kind of typical loose firm model where you might be not making much money and start to tighten it up and to add the best practices of productization or value-based fees or you know other um, systems in how you're delivering that work to make it significantly more more efficient, um, and then it could be a, a great result for people. Mm, absolutely. So again, I'm going to refer to the show notes. Folks should check out. Uh, I'll link to it, but check out "Built to Sell" by John Marlowe if you're interested in kind of a, a fictionalized. I guess it's kind of like an allegory that. Yeah, it's describes, a great book. Oh, you've read it. Too. I'm not surprised. <laughs> But yeah, it really. I've had John. Yeah, John's John's actually a really great guy. He's been on our podcast as well, and um, he's he's doing some really good stuff over at Value Builder right now. Yeah, big time. Yeah, I've interviewed him as well. So we're it's like a it's like we're all hugging. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of speaking of books, you've written a bunch of books. I've written books. How do you see those in the these sort of three business models? Because you didn't mention a product business, but if, I mean that makes sense because we're talking about consultants. So you, they're going to consult, but. Um, lots of consultants. I think it's probably generally a really good idea to have a book. Uh, how mm-hmm. do you see as we're wrapping up here? Uh, Cause I know you, I know you're busy, but how do you see a book fitting into this whole, uh, per- perhaps a book doesn't fit in one of these models. Maybe it fits better in another one, or maybe you think it's always a good idea or how do you think about that when you're uh, advising someone? Yeah. So, I mean, a, a book is not a business model. Um, and I would not suggest to anyone that uh, your book is going to be your business in the sense that uh, your book is not going to make you the money that's most likely going to make you happy. Um, you know, for most, for the vast majority of people, there's a very small percentage of people who write books that actually generate enough to, you know, to live on or to make them, to make them wealthy. Uh, but what a book is, is it's, I mean, some people describe it as like, it's just a, the best business card you can have. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I see it as is really, is, it's a best demonstration um, that you can provide to people to really demonstrate the value and expertise that you have. Uh, you know, here someone for a very low price or in some cases even even for free are able to access your your way of thinking and um, and have you know your you provide value so I think a book is always a great idea um, because it allows you to number one use it as part of your marketing number two people still look at it as you know if someone's written a book like it says something about them right it's like that that old mentality like oh that person has a book wow they must be super smart um, <laughs> right even though these days anyone can write a book but the reality is it's a great way to deliver value. It's a great way to demonstrate expertise. Um, and that's what marketing is all about. It's about putting valuable information or creating a valuable experience in front of your ideal clients or into the marketplace. And those that see that value and when it resonates with them and when they think that you understand them and that you can help them, they will then reach out to you. Um, or at least, you know, accept a a meeting or a conversation. So using a book, you know, can be a great way to generate leads. It can also be a great way to open up doors. It can be great as a um, follow-up component to your follow-up when you're targeting kind of going out and doing outreach to ideal clients. So yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of books. That's why uh, I've written three of them. And I think that, um, you know, it could be a, a great additional tool for anyone's tool belt. There's also lots of people I know who don't have books and are, wildly successful. So it's, it's not a, a prerequisite to, to success, uh, but it certainly can help to establish your credibility uh, and then to demonstrate that credibility. And it's also just so versatile and it's leveraged because you create it once um, and it can continue to bring more and more people into your world and allows you to continue using it over and over again. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Well, speaking of your three books, where can folks go to find out more about uh, your books and consulting success? Uh, yeah, so consultingsuccess.com is the home base for everything. We've got uh, a lot of articles there, videos, podcasts, resources, and so forth. Uh, I mentioned to you before that just given what's going on in the world right now, uh, I, I wrote a book called Act Now recently. And for that, I interviewed three, or I'm sorry, not three, I interviewed six thought leaders uh, in the space. Uh, people like Rita McGrath, actually John Warlow, who you just mentioned, he's one of the people in the book, uh, Perry Marshall, um, a whole bunch of others. Uh, about you know how they're handling the current situation with everything going on and what are they doing in their businesses? How are they supporting their clients? How are they thinking about marketing and sales and so forth? Uh, and so that book is is really a distillation of uh, of the best practices that successful people are are using to deal and, and not only to manage and survive this current challenging uh, time, but but really to uh, to set themselves up to thrive and prosper. Uh, and so I'm giving um, a copy or a free copy to to people of that book. 
Uh, so if you're interested, you can get that by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash act now. And it's uh, the free digital version. But of course, there's also the, the paperback and Kindle and audible versions if, um, if you prefer those. That sounds amazing. I would, I'm going to check that out. I think everyone else should too. That's fabulous. All right. Well, this has been amazing. I feel like we could probably talk for two hours. Um, but thanks so much for coming on, Michael. Let's keep in touch. And uh, if there's anything we can do together in the future, let's do it. Sounds great, Jonathan. Thank you so much for having me on um, and keep doing what you're doing because you put on an amazing podcast. Everything that you know that you create, um, I know is adding so much value for people. So uh, keep it up. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate it. All right, folks, that's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark, and I hope you join us again next time for Ditching Hourly. Bye. Hey, Jonathan here again. Do you have questions about how to improve your business? Things like value pricing your work instead of billing for your time, or positioning yourself as the go-to person in your space, or maybe productizing your services so you never have to have another awkward sales call or spend hours writing another custom proposal. Book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me and get answers to these questions and others in the time it takes you to get ready for work in the morning. Best of all, you're covered by my 100% satisfaction guarantee. If at the end of the call you don't feel like it was worth it, just say the word and I'll refund your purchase in full. To book your one-on-one -on -one coaching call, go to jonathanstark.com slash call, C-A-L-L. -L. That URL again is jonathanstark.com slash call.